so many stories that have circulated around your mom's death and yeah. and stuff. But you know, you know the truth. So rumors I mean, and stories. Yes. And... Yes. Hi guys, welcome to California Preaching. Honestly speaking, I have ah such an exciting guest today. I've been waiting for this interview forever. I feel like Barbara Walters. I've been waiting to get this interview forever. I say hello to Owen Elliot Kugel. Oh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> I love Aww. you. You guys, Owen and I have been friends for how you do the math because you know me with math. Well, <laughs> that would give away our ages. But uh, what I can right. say, what I can safely say is that we've known each other since, you know, we're both about one years old. And so Wait a second. Almost, I haven't known you since the day you were born? Well, I was born before you. So oh. that so that would have been a challenge. And for those who don't know, I mean, it's such a duh, but this is Mama Cass's daughter. So, um, so Cass obviously Elliot. we know each other. <laughs> Do you say buggy when people call her Mama Cass? No, because that's who they know her as. Right. Because I, you know more history about the moms and papas than I do. I mean, it's just a fact. You just, you just do. I don't know why. Maybe I'm just a little ADD. But like, you know a lot. You know the history. Do you know how the group actually formed? From what I understand, um, my mom was singing in a band uh, called the Big Three, and they were the house band at the Bitter End in the summer of 1962. Mm -hmm. And uh, Denny met my mom, he said, because he was walking. Denny Doherty. Denny Doherty. Who was the Papa lead, Denny. basically yep. the lead singer yep. of the Moms and Papas. He heard someone singing through the through the walls, the stone walls of the Bitter End, and he said he had to go and investigate. So that's what he did. And they met, and they became fast friends. They made a, a, a bid that they were going to actually try to outdrink each other, which is <laughs> sort of a, a weird thing. But... But my mother actually outdrank him. So did they decide they were going to form a group together? Daddy no, and, I think they just really, they got on really well. And I think truthfully, I think my mom had a little bit of a, a crush on Denny. Because let's face it, Denny was, you know, adorable. Yeah. A, a he was a real hottie. And a wonderful human being. To, yeah. Um, he was friends with your dad and your mom. And he introduced my mom to your parents. They all went on these hoot nanny tours, you know, to make money. Wow. And, and when they all got off of these tours and got back to the city is when that fateful evening apparently took took place where they all met up at your parents' apartment and tripped, you know, what, you know. That's acid. The trip yeah. to life fantastic, I guess <laughs> is a good way of putting it. That and then was, did they sing that night? Did they try harmonizing? Do I don't you know? think that they necessarily did did that, but they hung out and they had a great time together. Uh -huh. And shortly thereafter, your um, parents decided to go to the Virgin Islands. Yeah. And I know my mom was very reluctant to sing. Like, she really didn't want to sing. And my dad encouraged her and said, Michelle, you can do this. Like... Your your dad absolutely was a was a key component in encouraging your mom to sing and be part of the group. For yeah. Sure. yeah. So, anyways, going Wonder. to the Virgin Islands. So I they went to, so they went to the Virgin Islands. The the three of them, Denny and your mom and your dad, and my mom. My mom wasn't really necessarily part of their scene too much yet, but as I said before, I think she fancied Denny just a little bit. And when they all took off to the Virgin Islands. She went, well, I want to go too. So she followed them down there. Um, My mom said that she has this image of Mama Cass, of, of Cass, when she was... When she arrived When down she there. arrived down there, which is like this tiny speck down the beach, and it got closer and closer and closer. And as she started to take in the picture, she realized this is, this is, this is Cass. And she got yeah. so excited, and then she like ran to her. And... Yeah, well, they were because they, were they the weren't only... expecting her to be there, no, right? No, she they surprised she, them. She did. She surprised them. She showed up. Um, she was the only person who had the forethought to buy a round trip ticket, which which ended up <laughs> you know working in her favor. Right. Um, but she went down there, and she you know spent time with them, and they all started singing together on the beach, and. Um, just singing together all the time, and your dad and your mom and Danny got the job at Duffy's. My mom wasn't. Duffy's was like a restaurant. Was, was, a, was a club? Was a restaurant club on St. Thomas? Was mm -hmm. it St. Thomas they were on? Yeah. Um, 
and they they made a deal with the owner of the club that they would you know play and, and entertain everybody and and my mom got a job as a waitress so she was waiting tables while they were singing their their songs and doing their act and she was actually according to your mom singing in her parts like calling in her parts from the floor like she was you know waiting tables and singing her part you know oh my gosh that's because so she really wanted to be a part of the group you know but didn't and she feel wasn't i had heard that she felt insecure about being on stage was that it? I'm, I'm sure that was a part of it i'm mm -hmm. sure there were a lot of factors that factored into her not being on stage with them at that it's point. interesting that both your mother and my mother were very insecure about being in the band in the first place yeah. you know if they both sort of had these insecurities of like you know not really wanting to be on stage you would think that they would find common ground in in that yeah, thing. I think they did. Yeah, I think they did. Well, you know? they clearly became the best oh, yeah. of friends. I oh, mean, the best of friends. <laughs> they, they were very, very good friends. And... Very good friends. <clears throat> and they only got tighter as the band got bigger. I mean, I guess we should talk a little bit about uh, how they got the record deal. And so they went back to Los Angeles, right? They went back to New York. First. Uh, first. They right. went back to New York. My mom went back to New York first. When everyone, back, when everyone went back to New York after they'd been in the Virgin Islands, they discovered that, that the music, the music business had really kind of departed New York City and mm -hmm. and gone out to, to the West Coast. And that with, all the leaves were brown and the sky was gray well, well, on the East Coast. <laughs> yeah, it was. But more importantly, the the sun and the and groups like the Beach Boys, all of those sounds were coming out of California. Right. And there was there was a lot of energy out here. Mm -hmm. So people people were on and their Laurel way out. Canyon yeah. was popping. Yep. Yeah. So they came out here and your parents came out a little bit afterwards. Like I said, my mom came out here because she knew some people. So she was out here already. But your mom and your dad and Denny drove a one way car from the east coast to the west coast and, and you'd have to look in their books to find out the actual stories about that stuff but there are some really great stories about like how little time and how little sleep <laughs> was was actually gotten on that trip by, by those people from from denny's perspective he he told me that your your father had a very clear vision of what he wanted that group to be and mm. to look like. Mm. And if somebody remember you, if people remember what Peter Paul and Mary looked like, you know that sort of. And and your mom was you know she was a she dog was woof, not woof. not a, anyway. <laughs> but he had a very clear vision, and you know what? A rotund Jewish girl was kind of not in the plan. I but such a lack of vision on my father's part because that was what really made right. the group. It made them stand apart from and from other bands Thousand in that percent. way. To be an overweight woman, to you know, all all of that stuff was was a very big deal. And I really think that she paved the way Absolutely. for a lot of people who are pioneer are you know heavier in stature. She sort of was a little different than than everybody, and mm -hmm. I think that's a hard thing to. To come to terms with sometimes. Well, when you're when everybody kind of found each other again in LA, they they did a lot of singing there, and mm -hmm. my mom was very good friends with Barry McGuire, mm. um, who of course um, sang Eve of Destruction and was was on top of the, the charts at that point. And he was he was signed to Dunhill Records, mm -hmm. and he heard the group sing and just thought they were amazing and when mm -hmm. you have got you guys have got to come down and sing for my producer Lou Adler uh, my mom was still not she'd still not been officially asked by your dad to join the group he was still kind of that holdout mm -hmm. you know thing and and they begged her to go to the audition and she went Okay, fine. So they went down. Let's just mention that Lou Adler, obviously, legendary producer already by that time. Right. He was a legendary producer. Yes. So they sang for Lou, and he really enjoyed, he really loved them. They sang California Dreamin'. Yeah. They sang Monday, Monday. They sang Creek Alley. I think so. You'd have to ask your mom exactly what songs were, were sung, but I know that they sang, they sang everything that they had mastered on the island. Everything that they had mastered. So they wrote those songs on the island, I think, correct? Well, your dad and your mom wrote California Dreamin' in New, New York, York City in the winter. I think they wrote it before they went to the island. Right. So, not. so they so they auditioned for Lou. He loved him. And he said, 
come back tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And they went back tomorrow. And mm -hmm. when they went back to the studio, there were contracts all over the floor. Um, and your mom, your your mom says that my mom whipped out a Mont Blanc pen. I don't know where she got it. Again, we'll have to ask your mom. She whipped out a pen and yes, signed it with the floor. She was so excited because she maybe she was she was part of the band. Yeah, you know, it was all like. Yeah, and, and it was like dream come true, yeah. you know, to have Dunhill yeah. Records offer you a contract, yeah. you know. But I think my dad was a little had more reservations, or was it Denny that was like, "Hold on, we got to read these contracts," you know? Or did they all just kind of sign? They it all like? just signed it. They didn't <laughs> read anything. They didn't sign anything. And in those days, record contracts were maybe two or three pages long. Mm -hmm. And today they're right. forty or fifty yeah. or sixty pages long because there's all kinds of other stuff they put in them. But yeah. But they're very, very simple. So mm -hmm. I think they were just excited. Yes, you know? definitely. This was, this was great. They were on their way. Because they had all these friends from the village that had come out to L.A. and become a success. Mm -hmm. Like David Crosby and the Birds. So, mm -hmm. you know, they, they kind of, they, they're like, he can do it, we can do it. Right. You know? So. And at this point, they had their name, the Mamas and the Papas. Did they get that from the Hells Angels? They How they got that, when they were in California and they were living together. I think this, this is after they got the deal. They were all living together in, a, in an apartment, which that must have been an interesting scene, but mm -hmm. they were all living together in an apartment and they were watching TV one night and they were watching Les Crane and he was interviewing the Hells Angels on TV and Les Crane said to the head, to one of the heads of the Hells Angels, you know, you know, what do you, what do you call your, your women? And he said, well, we call our women mamas. You know, the, the, the mamas take out the trash and, the, you know, so they looked at each other and went, oh, my God, we should be called the mamas and the papas. We do, we're the mamas and you're the yes, papas. Yes. And so we should be called the mamas and the papas. And that's, Such a great and that's name for a band, for a group. Because they were the first band, as my mom really liked to say, they were, you know, sexually integrated <laughs> you know they were they were one of the first fans that were you know had all had women singing with men yeah you know and that and that was a, a really different thing yeah Lou decided to obviously release uh California Dreaming as their first single and yeah. it obviously was a tremendous success mm -hmm. For them, and I remember the story. weren't they in the car? I was just gonna say, tell a they story. Were, they were in the store. They were in the car. You know, the, one of the things convertible. That, one a... of the things that they bought when they got their advance. I mean, it's. I remember the story. I don't know if it was in your dad's book or your mom's book, but the, the story that you know Lou apparently said to your dad. You know, you know, like this is great. You know, here's the contracts, and your dad said, you know, well, what we really need is a steady stream of income from your office. To our bank accounts, like that was this famous saying. And that then sounds like something one my of the father would And say. one of the things that they that they asked for and that they got was money to go rent a house together mm -hmm. and to buy a car. Mm -hmm. And they bought a car, and apparently they were in this said car all together when they heard California Dreaming on the radio, going up Laurel Canyon, and they flipped out, turned it up. Can you imagine and that screamed. moment. I know. Can you imagine that moment? What that must have been like for them. Mm -hmm. I mean. I remember I heard Hold On for the first time ever on the radio when we were in like Seattle or something and we were in a van and it was my birthday and I was like, oh, happy birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> they, they promoted the hell out of that record. They did so many television appearances. They did Ed Sullivan. They did um, Get It Together. They, mm -hmm. they were on all, all of the, the television programs of the day mm -hmm. that people were, were on. At those Ed Sullivan performances, Your Mother and the Banana. Can we just talk about Your Mother and the Banana? Everyone always comments about my mom and the banana. Yeah, but what's great They're is like, that why did she do that? She was hungry. She told me she was just hungry, and so she grabbed but the banana. But she missed a lot of vocal cues. <laughs> Because she's singing into the freaking banana. It's <laughs> <laughs> so great. But it's it's that great lip sync moment. Yeah. You know what I mean? When, when exactly. you look at any old musical performance where yeah. somebody's like on one of those shows and, yeah. they're, and they're obviously lip syncing and they completely miss the cue. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Hi, honey. Mother. Hi. Mom, I have the most random question for you. So remember when you did that TV show back in the 60s with the moms and papas and you had the banana in your hand? Do you know why you had that banana in your hand? Uh, 
you know what, China? It was so random, <laughs> as you put it. You know, we were just lip syncing to the song. Yeah. And then I looked over and there was this plate of fruit. And there was a banana there. And so I just reached over and started peeling it. And I ate it. <laughs> while the cameras were rolling like <laughs> just started eating it yeah i love that i just love that well it was very spontaneous i'll say i looked over and i was trying to do something with my hands to do anything because i felt a little awkward mom it was an iconic moment <laughs> Moms and papas, I mean, they were together for what, two, maybe two or three, three years. years? They made a lot of music in two or three years. Yeah, I'll say. They made a couple, like two or three records um, within that period of time, and they worked constantly. The performance for, for on Monday Monday won a Grammy Award for Best Performance by a Group in 1967. You know who they were nominated against? Who? The Beach Boys. Ah! <laughs> for for good vibration. No. Ooh, that must have hurt. That's a performance. That's a performance. I don't know. That's I'm feeling like we should have given the Grammy to the Beach Boys. <laughs> and your mom and your dad and Denny attended the Grammy Awards, but my mother did not. Why? Because she was very pregnant with me. Oh, well. Really? It's crazy to think that the moms and papas were only together for what, two, maybe, two maybe or, three years? Two or three years. I think that after two or three years, um, my mom was really ready. I think Dream a Little Dream with me really gave her a taste of what it could feel like to be a solo mm -hmm. artist. Um, and so she decided she wanted to go and be a solo artist. So, and at this point, was she pregnant with you? I, th I think she'd already had me by this by this time. Now, this is an interesting question. At what age did you find out who your father actually was? Because it was a mystery for quite some time, right? It, my my mother guarded the identity of my father very very closely. She was very private about it and just didn't think it was relevant you know because the truth was that when when I was born she called me her very own mm -hmm. which is pretty much why I was named Owen it's almost a slight oh, derivative interesting. of, of interesting. Owen in fact she had a music publishing company called very Owen music wow so she, I, I was really hers I mean she really made the decision to have a baby she really truthfully wanted somebody in her life that was going to love her and never going to leave mm -hmm. you know and she thought the best way to do that would be to have a baby so she um set out to become pregnant with me and here I am I mean you know yeah and it, did you ever meet your I mean I know the answer to this that's a stupid question but tell us how you met your birth father well I your mom was always really super curious about who my so not even was. my mother knew you no know, nobody knew my mother this didn't tell insane. anybody and right before my mother was um, going to go to London for her final engagement um, at the at the London Palladium. Palladium. She had two um, weeks know, sold out. Kind kind of a big deal, mm -hmm. you know. Especially as a solo artist, to not be, you know, she was billed as Cass Elliot. Finally, she wasn't billed as Mama Cass, mm -hmm. and I think that was a big deal, or at least that was the way it was supposed to be. I think they may have added Mama at one point, which really annoyed her. <laughs> in, in any event, she said to your mom on this day that she came over and she brought you, and we, you and I, were swimming in the pool. And that they were, you know, kind of sitting on the side of, by the side of the pool. And that she said to my mom, you know, tell me who Owen's dad is. Tell me who Owen's father is. And my mom promised to tell her when she got back from her trip. Which, of course, didn't happen. And your mom has had really, you know, wanted to solve that mystery. I think mm -hmm. partially for her own curiosity. But I think really, part she really wanted me to know. Mm -hmm. You know, and she... She found him for me. She like um, literally. With she the, literally with found the him. Private detective. She, yeah. In 1986, the straight shooter video was being made. That with that documentary about the mamas and papas was being made. Mm -hmm. The your dad and Denny and my mom were were together for the first time in 
decades mm -hmm. after that after they were done shooting that day they were all going to go to dinner and um denny actually called me up it was actually on my birthday uh, mm -hmm. of 1986 and denny called me up and said look we're all going to go to dinner come with us so i joined them on the way to that dinner your mom was driving your dad was in the car and denny was in the car and they were all in this car together alone which is kind of interesting and your mom said I can't believe we never knew who Owen's dad was. And Denny and your dad looked at each other and gave each other knowing looks like, oh, you don't know? <laughs> she never told you? So I, I guess my mom must have told Denny. Wow. Who he was. Wow. So, then so they had his name. So they, had, they knew his name. And that was all your mom needed. She was off and running. <laughs> <laughs> and she she found him for me and she called me up when she had finally you know figured out who he was and where he was and made contact with him and she called me up and she said come over and so I went over to the house and she put a plane ticket in my hand to go to San Francisco and she said go meet him yeah and he was at my mother's funeral but didn't identify himself wow stood across the street Wow. But I will say, sometimes reality... Yeah, it's true. Reality is does not measure up to fantasy at mm -hmm. all. And I had a real fantasy of what mm -hmm. he was. And he was fairly far removed from mm -hmm. from what mm -hmm. from what I fantasized. But he did create you, so we got to give he him did. some credit. Because yeah, you're an amazing for woman. The, for the five minutes of his time that that probably took, <laughs> I'm grateful. <laughs> So many stories that have circulated around your mom's death and yeah. and stuff, but you know you know the truth. So I rumors mean, and stories. Yes, and yes. The last time I saw my mom, she took me to the airport to uh, put me on an airplane to go to Baltimore to stay with my grandmother for the summer because she was leaving to go to, to London for for a month or so to do these shows at the Palladium. and at the Palladium. And um, I remember. Her taking me to the airport, taking me through security, putting me on the plane, um, putting my little seatbelt on, you know, giving me kisses, saying we'll be together really soon, don't worry. And then she was, and she told me, you know, look, make sure you look inside the airport, you know, because we were, we were parked at the gate, mm -hmm. you could see the windows of people inside the airport. She goes, go look, make sure you look right there because... I'm gonna be right there, I'm gonna to wave to you. She got off the plane and she went in and I looked and there she was and she was doing this and it's just really wild that my last memory of her is of her quite literally waving goodbye. Waving goodbye. Right? Yeah. I mean, you just can't even, you can't even imagine. And then she wrote you a beautiful letter from London. Wow, that letter. I that mean. letter, the letter that she wrote me from London actually was never mailed. That letter kind of, I think, probably came back with, with her possessions mm -hmm. from London. Well, she was busy. Yeah, she, she didn't have time. <laughs> and um, I found that letter years and years after she died, and I found it by looking through a, a photo album, and it fell out. Mm. And it's this beautiful letter that she wrote, mm. that she wrote to me, and she wrote it. You know, it's like a mom, like a mother would write to a child. It's very much written in, Did your in that heart kind of... stop? Oh, my when God. You... It's... it's it's beautiful, and she addresses she addresses it to um, to Owenski, which is what mm. her nickname for me was. Mm. And she talks about lots of random stuff. She talks stuff, about stuff like, that you would yeah. talk about to your seven year old daughter. Yeah, where you are, what what the theater looks like. It has big beautiful curtains, and it holds this many people. And every day I go here, and I do this and this and this, and it's just really beautiful because it's just such a it's such a letter of, from a mother to a child. Yes. My mother spent a lot of her adulthood battling her weight, mm -hmm. doing diets, some, some of them not healthy for you, mm -hmm. some of them, you know, downright dangerous mm -hmm. for you. She also was no innocent individual as, 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 my mother as was. some of our parents, <laughs> some of our parents were not. <laughs> I think that there were a lot of factors to my mom's death. I think the fact that she was up for two and a half days mm -hmm. before she passed away. Were there drugs around? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
do we know that she did him? We suspect it. Mm -hmm. You know, when when she died, many of her contemporaries had had passed away from drug addictions. Mm -hmm. Janis Joplin, Jimi Hendrix. I mean, just so many. How old was your mother? My mom was thirty three, so she she was not part of that twenty seven club that they that they talk about. She was thirty two, turning thirty three. So when she died, um, her manager who was a guy named Alan Carr, who would go on later to produce movies like I Grease. I mean, kind of a not, a, not a not a schlump. He represented people like Anne Margaret. I mean, he was a really mm-hmm. big manager at the time, and um, he was representing her. And we know now, and it took a lot of sleuthing to figure mm-hmm. out exactly how this happened, he, I think, had some fear that people were going to assume that she died you know, from illicit causes. And he wanted to avoid that. And having uh, been to her apartment where she had passed away, mm-hmm. uh, he noticed that there was a, a sandwich, mm-hmm. a ham sandwich, mm-hmm. um, that was by her bedside. Although it didn't have a bite taken out of it, there was a sandwich there. And so he phoned uh, an associate of his here in Los Angeles, mm-hmm. who worked for the Hollywood Reporter, who was a reporter, um, who's an, actually a friend of mine as well, named Sue Cameron. Mm-hmm. He asked her to to write the story of my mother choking on a ham sandwich. So it's not true at all that your mom no. choked on a ham sandwich. My mom passed away in her sleep. Mm-hmm. She had a, she had a heart attack in her sleep, and mm-hmm. she died. Mm-hmm. So then you were seven. I was seven when she passed away. I mean, I spent a lot of time being, really having a hard time understanding mm-hmm. that that story because it had such lasting effect. Mm-hmm. And even to the point where when I was growing up and I would go over to like see a, a, to a friend's house mm-hmm. and have dinner like with their family mm-hmm. and their mom and dad would go, oh, so did your mom really die choking on a ham sandwich? First of all, who does that? Who does that? Who does that? Who, who does that? Hello. And it was horrible for me. It was horrible yeah. for me. So I was really angry about it, and I really had to figure out what. Where did this start? Where did it come from? Yeah. And my grandmother told me that my mother oh, okay. was gone. I was with my grandmother when my mom died, and she came. I I was at summer camp, and they brought me home early, and I remember her sitting me down at her dining room table in her little apartment in Baltimore Mm -hmm. and telling me that my mom you know had had died and that she wasn't going to come home and I remember actually not really believing her Mm -hmm. and I remember just getting up from the table and just you know sure walking away yeah Um, because I was really used to her not being around Mm -hmm. I was really used to her traveling a lot Mm -hmm. and I was kind of like well I mean you know they don't know they don't know they don't know know. only I know Mm -hmm. and just wait Mm-hmm. But then you I, got to Los Angeles and realized but then we, the, then it all we, started to sink in. Yeah, then we came back and, and had the funeral, and it was a horrific experience. I mean, as, as you would imagine it would be, but there was paparazzi everywhere. And this mm-hmm. is 1974. Was there even paparazzi back then? But I guess there was. You know, I remember my mom on her way to the funeral. I remember that I was playing outside with a snail, mm-hmm. like literally on the sidewalk playing with right. a snail. And my mom came out in all black glasses, yep. you know, sunglasses, mm-hmm. all black. And she was just so withdrawn and so overwhelmed with grief. I could just, I didn't, but she hadn't told me yet. And I just remember saying, mom, is everything okay? And she said, no, sweetie. She said, Cass died. And I just remember like my heart sunk because I first I didn't know that information and we were such good friends. Yeah, she was my mom. Yes. Yeah. Well, I love that uh, you know, we're sort of carrying on the legacy, me with California preaching, you know, the play on words with California dreaming and you are writing a book right now, right, honey? I am in the process of writing a, a book that's um, mostly about my mom mm-hmm. and, and by default a small bit about me. Mm-hmm. Well, it has um, to be. So I'm kind of in the throes of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's, it's. Is it inspiring and exciting and or emotional? I'm sure it's. It's, it's an emotional experience, and, oh. I'm, and I'm bringing up a lot of memories that I didn't even remember I had. Yeah, you know? but it's it's a great experience because it's really kind of the culmination 
of a lot of these, you know, mystery questions yes. I had. So it's great to be able to be at a point where I can, you know, have the answers. Yeah. To a Must lot be of that very stuff. cathartic to write Huge, out these. Hugely cathartic. Yeah. Hugely cathartic. Uh -huh. You know, we're all in the same boat, all of us, as as the kids of of these people. You know, the mamas and papas. <laughs> yeah. We're the daughters and the sons. We're the daughters and the I sons. Mean, without being blood related, I feel like we're all we're all related. Oh, there's a, a very special way. kinship it's, there. It it really is. Whenever there's some sort of drama in the family, and trust me, there's plenty. Um, I'm always there to enjoy it. <laughs> she's first on the scene. Oh God. Uh, no, but we so appreciate that about you, and I feel like you're my sister, and I love you so much, and. I'm I so too. grateful that you did this for, I mean, I know all my Bible babes are so excited that you did this interview with me and I'm about to cry. So don't we, let her cry. We can't have that, but I well, just I love, love you, you so love much. You Can we sing a little bit just to end it? No. Yeah. Stars shining bright above you. <laughs> Words whispering and night breezes. Night, night <laughs> just, breezes just, seem to just whisper. Just it right here. Just, I just love take you. Take it and be done with it. Birds singing in the sycamore tree. Yeah. Come on. Dream a little dream of me. Thank you for enjoying and being a part of this incredible episode of California Preaching Honestly Speaking. Peace of Christ. Bye, guys. Hey, you guys, if this video blessed you in any way, I pray that you will subscribe. And I also pray that you'll press that little button next to the subscribe because that is an alert button and it will give you a notification every single time there's a brand new Cal Preach. And of course, share because sharing is caring and you just never know who's going to find the peace of Christ. Amen.